Okay, everybody, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Be'ezrat Hashem, tonight we will be studying Parashat Bo, this week's parasha. Uh, great school to be learning with you. First of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Shaban family, sponsoring Le'ilu Nishmat Bracha Polet Bat Rachel, of blessed memory. May her neshama go higher and higher in Gan the 11 months and, since her passing. But the school of mitzvot, the Shaban family. <clears throat> may her neshama go higher and higher, and may she be Melitzat Yosher for her family and for the community and for all of Klal Yisrael, B'Zal Hashem. Also, we'd like to dedicate tonight's learning um, for their flash mom, Shachma ben Chana, and Yaakov Yisrael Abba ben Chana, Esther Helen. May they have a refuash the mom, B'Toch Shal Cholei Yisrael, B'Zal Hashem, and also Lilu Nishmat Giti Bat Yaakov, who also uh, has her 11 months this week. Chazakim Abruchim. So, in this week's parasha, we have the, of course, the last three plagues that take place in the parasha. But I would like to zone in on a piece that was written by the Ramban, Rabbeinu Moshe ben Nachman. In this piece, the Ramban, uh, which is located in this week's parasha, the Ramban speaks about one of the most important fundamental subjects uh, in Torah. And he explains the reason that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to bring all of these ten makot on Egypt. And he explains with that the reason for many of the mitzvot in the Torah. And he lays out the fundamental groundwork that really every Jew is supposed to know. And uh, I think it's appropriate that this week uh, we discuss it because I think that the message that the Ramban is giving us is needed now as much as it has ever been needed. So with that, Zad Hashem, I would like to go through the, the, the Ramban with you. It's at the end of Parashat Bo, if anybody would like to uh, look inside while we're doing it. And I think that we're all going to gain a tremendous amount. I would like to break down this Ramban into four different parts. Uh, and Be'ezat Hashem will go through it uh, one part at a time, message by message. It's very, very important for all of us to understand. It's going to shed a lot of light on the rest of the parasha that Zashim afterwards will get to as well. So the Ramban addresses the idea that the Torah has given us many, many mitzvot. Many mitzvot, many of which are related to the topic of this week's parasha, which is the exodus of Egypt. The idea that many mitzvot are directly related. At the end of that mitzvah, you'll see this is a commemoration for the exodus of Egypt. So the Ramban wants to know why. Why is this something that the Torah makes us do over and over and over again? What is the significance of this? Why is it that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to go through all of these 10 plagues as well to bring out the Jewish people? What was the reason for all of this? So the Ramban starts off with a very important discussion, and he says the following. The Ramban says there were mistaken beliefs out there in the world ever since Enosh, ever since the time that idol worship started with Enosh, which was uh, the generation where idols came into the picture. People started worshiping the sun and the moon and all these different things. So since then, there were two main mistaken beliefs that existed in the world. The first one was that people, some people believed that the world always existed. It was in existence since basically forever. And God forbid, but there is no God. That's what people were saying. That's one mistaken belief, God forbid, to say that the world just existed on its own, came into being by itself, and there is no God. The second mistaken belief was not that there is no God. No, that, that doesn't make sense because there has to have been a creator. But the idea is that the creator created the world and then simply walked away from it. There is no, um, there's no punishment. There's no reward. There's no purpose. It's a creation that was created um, even very nicely, even very intricately. But then the creator walked away from the scene and let, let nature take its course. Whatever happens, happens. There's no, no rhyme or reason. Just whatever it is, that's what it is. That explains the Ramban 
is mistaken belief number two. Now, in order to get rid of those mistaken beliefs, explains the Ramban beautifully, he says, when you see a revealed miracle, not just a revealed miracle, but it's a targeted revealed miracle. It's specifically to help a group or specifically to help a person get out of a certain situation. That revealed miracle, explains the Ramban, is a refutation to both of those mistaken beliefs. Because if you think that revealed that this thing could just happen by itself, then you're out of your mind. There's no way that all of a sudden, uh, for this Jewish guy who's drinking water, uh, the water it's, it's water from the Nile River, yet for this guy who takes the cup out of the Jew's hand, it all of a sudden becomes blood. I mean, it doesn't make sense. There's no, there's no uh, logical way to explain that. That all of a sudden when the Jews are standing by the sea and the, behind them are the Egyptians and in front of them is the ocean, all of a sudden the sea splits. I mean, there's no logical way that you can explain that. It's a revealed miracle. It's a revealed, a clear revealed miracle. And it's one clear revealed miracle after the next revealed miracle, after the next. Moshe says the frog should go away. The frogs go away. Uh, you know, everything that happens is clearly divinely orchestrated. So these miracles had a purpose, explains the Ramban. The purpose was to make it very clear that Hashem not only created the world, which the people were denying, but that Hashem is watching over the world and knows everything that's happening in the world and has what to say about it and cares about it. So the idea being, says the Ramban, that it's not that Hashem created the world and walked away and let everything in nature just take its course. No, it was completely deliberately created and it's being watched over and there's supervision and Hashem knows everything and cares about everything and wants to make sure that if there's an injustice that it gets, that it gets corrected. That's the message of these open miracles. So we started with a question. Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu bring these 10 plagues? So of course we know, like, we, like it says in the parasha, we mentioned last week, Hashem wanted to show them that their gods are fake. Hashem brings in this week's parasha darkness to knock out the sun, which they believed was a god. Hashem in this week's parasha commands us to take the sheep and slaughter it in front of their eyes, and they believed the sheep was a god. So definitely there was an attack on the sheep and on the sun and on the Nile River as well that turned into blood, which they all believed were gods. So Hashem is showing them these are not gods. These are fake. You got it all wrong. But besides for that, they had this doubt. They had this confusion. Is there really a being that is watching over everything, that created everything, and is in charge of everything? That question has now been answered, explains the Ramban. By bringing out the ten plagues, HaKadosh Baruch Hu addressed that very question. Now, not only that, explains the Ramban, but when that miracle is, like we said, announced by a prophet, that not only is that miracle taking place, but it was mentioned ahead of time. The prophet came and said, you should know, tomorrow there will be locusts in the land, right? Tomorrow there's going to be a tremendous plague of, uh, of, of, of animals dropping dead. Whenever, whenever Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron came and told Paro, and they announced it ahead of time, and then it took place, now we know not only does Hashem uh, have total control over the world and is watching over everything, but Hashem also communicates with His servants and reveals His secret to those who serve Him which now gives us the understanding of why it is that Moshe Rabbeinu had such authority and why Aaron had such authority, because they are the vehicle through which Hashem brings out His message to the world. So what we see is that when they give us the Torah Kedosha, when Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from Mark Sinai with the Torah Kedosha, every word is truth. Moshe emet the Torah to emet, because Moshe is the vehicle through which Hashem delivers his message through the, to the world. 
So over here, these are the fundamental lessons that we learn from what happened in Egypt, that Hashem reveals his secret to his servants, and therefore his servants have 100% validity without any question. So this is what the Egyptians had gotten wrong. They had these mistaken beliefs, uh, and what we, what we see over here, I'll read to you the words of the Ramban inside. He says, Shehu shalit bakol. This teaches us of Hashem's strength, that He has got total control. En me'akev be'yado. There's nothing that holds Hashem's hand back from doing whatever He wants to do. Ki bechol ze hayu ha-mitzrim makhishim o mistabkim. In all of these areas, the Egyptians were either denying it or they were questioning it. Now over here, by doing these 10 plagues, by bringing these 10 plagues on the Egyptians, there's no more questions. It's very clear that Kadosh Baruch Hu is watching over everything, in control of everything, and can do everything. So that is part one of this Ramban. Now comes part two. Explains the Ramban. So now where does this leave us, the Jewish people? Our job, in two words, is never forget. Never forget. What you saw take place in Egypt, you have a job. Never forget that. Because since the lesson is so fundamental to what it means to be a Jew, it's so pivotal in order for us to understand that there is total hashgacha, total supervision of everything. Everything that takes place is under the auspices of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's nothing that happens without Hashem knowing. So we have to remember that we have to do something in order to solidify that in our neshamot. It has to become a part of our bones. We have to never forget that that is true. So obviously the generation that was in Egypt has it very clear. They saw the miracles. They saw the Nile turn into blood. They saw Paro, the, the greatest empire, crumble. They saw everything with their own eyes. They don't have the problem. The problem is for the future generations. What will the future generations do? They did not see it. They don't have that same visual aid that the original generation did have. So for that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, this is what you do. You have to remember the exodus of Egypt all the days of your life, don't ever forget what your forefathers saw in Egypt. So what do we do? That's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu told us, you have to put, you have to do mitzvot, you have to do things that will never let you forget. For example, the mitzvah of tefillin. The mitzvah of tefillin is a mitzvah, it's at the end of this week's parasha, and inside of the tefillin are four paragraphs. The first one is Shema, the second one is Vayayim Shamoah, then you have Kadesh Li and Vayaki Viacha. All talking about the idea that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has total control over nature, is completely in charge of everything, and that Hashem took us out of Egypt. Hayom Atem Yotzim, Hashem says, today you're leaving Egypt. Put that on your head. Put that on your arm, which corresponds to your heart. Wear them every day. As a matter of fact, it used to be in the times of the Gemara, they would wear their tefillin all day from morning till night. The message has to be clear. You have to have it on your body physically, if you're a man, every day. Not only that, put it on your doorposts. Put it on your mezuzot. When you walk into the house, you have to see this message too. You have to see that you know that Hashem is in charge of everything that goes on when you walk into your home, when you walk into your bedroom, you have to have this message in mind that Hashem is in charge of everything. Not only everything that goes on in this bedroom or in this house, but everything in the world. And remember this constantly. You have these reminders all around your house so that you never forget the lesson. You have to say it twice a day. Again, if you're a man. In the Shema. Every morning, every night. You have to remember at the end, I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt. We say it in Shacharit in the morning. We say, There's special songs for that. 
ממצרים גאלתנו, השם you took us out of Egypt, מבית עבדים פליטנו, you took us out from the house of servitude, at night time we say, uh, again, same idea, we say, העושה לנו ניסים ונקמה בפרעה באדמת בני חם, השם you did miracles for us against פרעה, in the land of the children of Ham. Again, every single day of your life, you're saying these words. There's not a day that goes by that you don't say these words. Again, you have to ask yourself, why? What, what's the purpose? Every Friday night at Kiddush, Zechel Yitzhak Mitzrayim. We say that this is a commemoration of the exodus of Egypt. We have two huge major holidays that are just around this point. Pesach is all about this. And look, you can't eat a, eat a little drop of uh, chametz. If there's a flake of chametz, the, the whole house goes upside down. Right? It, God forbid. It's, that, it's an isur karet. It's a violation that's punishable by, God forbid, excision, getting cut off from Hashem, chas v'chalila. Right? Sukkot, if the sukkah is off a little bit, it's not kosher. What's the whole purpose of sukkot? Remember, Hashem took us out of Egypt. He surrounded us with the clouds of glory. The whole... These two major holidays are revolving around the Yetziat Mitzrayim, the Exodus of Egypt. Again, why does Hashem make us remember this so much to go crazy over a little speck of chametz that we, we turn our kitchens over to be Pesach uh, types of kitchens? What's the purpose of all of this? The answer is these are mechanisms, explains the Ramban. These are tools that Hashem has given us to never forget the Exodus from Egypt. Because when you remember the exodus from Egypt, you are remembering at that moment that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in charge of everything in the entire world. That Hashem has complete and total control. Nothing is able to stop Him from doing what He wants to do. That's why we have to remember Yetziat Mitzrayim every single day in the morning, at nighttime, when you walk into your room and you kiss the mezuzah and you're saying, what's inside that mezuzah? Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hashem is one, there's nothing besides HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's the message that we're trying to drill into our bones. It should be very part of our very being because of the fact that this is the most important message, that we have to remember that Hashem is with us, watching us, together with us, there for us, to, to help us. That's the idea. That's the very important idea that we're trying to do. I'll read you the words of the Ramban. Look at, look at how he articulates this so beautifully. He says, Ki echad. A person purchases a mezuzah for one zuz. Not that, not that much money. The bepitcho. He puts it on his doorpost. And he has in mind the reason that he's doing this. He has in mind the purpose of what he's doing. To put up the mezuzah here. Kvar hoda by doing so. He has acknowledged the idea that Hashem created the world. He has acknowledged that Hashem knows what's going on and is watching over everything. He also admits that there was a prophet, Moshe, that came and gave us the Torah that told us to put up this mezuzah. He's showing you he believes in every word that the Torah says. Besides for the fact that he's saying that Hashem's kindness is very great for those who do what he wants them to do, that he took us out from that slavery to freedom. So look at all that goes into one mezuzah. This one mitzvah alone is there so much. We, every time we walk by, we think about it, we internalize the message, or at least we, we can try to, but that's what it's there for, that we should remember that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in charge of everything, that He has total control, and that He sent us Moshe Rabbeinu and gave us the Torah. Look at how much is in one mezuzah. Amazing. So that's our job. Never forget. Never forget the idea that we, as our forefathers were in Mitzrayim, they were slaves and they were taken out and HaKadosh Baruch Hu saved them and performed open miracles, revealed miracles for them. That's our job, to remember that. Now, why is this our job? Part three of the Ramban, 
amazing Ramban, Rabotai. I, I, I would recommend everybody. It's the last Ramban in the parasha. If you have a moment to look, go through it, they even have the Ramban in English. It's worth it to go through this Ramban. Why is this our job? Explains the Ramban. The answer is, in his amazing, amazing way, he explains the purpose of our creation. Why were we created? In the words of the Ramban, we were created so that we can acknowledge that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created us. We're here in order to be able to stand up and say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you made us. Every mitzvah that we do, all mitzvot, is for this purpose, to acknowledge that Hashem created us, to acknowledge that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the master of the universe. That's really what we say when we make a blessing. Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you Hashem, Elokeinu our God, Melech HaOlam, master of the universe. That's the whole purpose of all of these blessings, right? That's the idea, that we are here to go ahead and to thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu for creating us. That's the purpose of all these mitzvot. So now, over here, Rabotai, this is the reason he explains why a shul is so important. Why is a shul so important? Why is a minyan so important? I'll read to you the words of the Ramban. It's amazing. Says the Ramban, Kavanat Batea Knesiot, the reason for shuls, for synagogues, Uzchut Tfilat Rabin, the added benefit of praying together with many people. Zehu Sheihye Makom Livne Adam Midkabtsu Veyodu Lakel Shibraam Vim Tsiam. It's in order that there should be a place where people gather together and they thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu for creating them. And that he fashioned them. They publicize this in public. And they say in front of Hashem, You created us. That's the purpose, really, of creation totally. So when you have a place that is there for that exact purpose, that's why that place is so beloved to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because that's the whole purpose of that place for people to be able to come there and to thank Hashem for creating them and to acknowledge that Hashem created them and is in charge of every aspect of the entire world. That's the whole reason HaKadosh Baruch Hu created us. Amazing from the Ramban, that we should know that Hashem is watching us and together with us from the very moment we, we breathed in our first breath of air. That's the way the Ramban explains it. So when you remember Egypt every day, and you go through all these different motions. You say in the morning, and you say Shema Yisrael, and you put on tefillin, and you kiss the mezuzah, and you say Kiddush Friday night, and you stay away from chametz on Pesach, and you sit in the sukkah on Sukkot. All of these things are here in order to remind us this one point, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is with us every step of the way and has been with us for thousands of years, has never left has always been with us, has protected us, watched over us. And God forbid to think like those Egyptians thought for half a minute that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has created the world and walked away. Or that HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't create it. Chas V'Shalim didn't even say such a thing. The whole purpose is to remember that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is with us every step of the way and continues to be with us. They say, as a matter of fact, over from Le'avdil Elef al Avdalot, they say it over, it was a conversation between Voltaire, one of the uh, famous uh, authors uh, throughout the ages, together with one of the kings, maybe it was the king of France, I don't remember which one it was. And the king asked him proof for the existence of God. And Voltaire responded, look at the Jews. You see the Jews? They're, they've survived throughout so much persecution, so much carnage, Egypt, the Inquisition, the Holocaust, you name it. There's, there's no way to explain the survival of the Jews if not for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's the only way you can explain it. That's the message over here of Bitzat Mitzrayim. Never forget what happened. Because by never forgetting, you remember that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in charge of everything and took care of us and continues to take care of us even now. So Rabotai, over here, now explains the Ramban. We have our final task. Now comes the next challenge. Says the Ramban, so you know that. You know that Hashem is in charge of the world. 
You know that Hashem is in charge of everything. Very good. But now the final task is to know that what you saw back then as a revealed open miracle, what you saw as the Nile River turning into blood, you saw the, uh, the, the darkness covering the, uh, the sun. You saw all of these miraculous things, wild animals coming out of nowhere and eating up uh, everybody except the Jews. You saw all of these miracles taking place. Okay. So you can identify that those things are miracles. Beautiful. But now comes your next and final challenge. Your next and final challenge, explains the Ramban, is to understand that even the things that take place around you, which we do not perceive to be open miracles, are indeed miracles as well. Which means a person, Baruch Hashem, has a heart that's beating. He has lungs that are inhaling, exhaling. He's got, Baruch Hashem, the right balance of hormones in his body, the amino acids, the lipids, and all the different parts of his proteins are operating to properly allow his body to function. There are so many things that are involved in his body, or the grass is growing, or the apple came out of the tree. And everything that you see around you, everything that's involved in your day-to-day life, all of that explains the Ramban, which we do not perceive to be miraculous, but rather we perceive it to be normal, ordinary, standard. Those two are miracles. That is your last and final task, says the Ramban. And I'll read to you his words. It's so powerful. I'll read to you what he says. A person does not have a portion in the Torah of Moshe, our teacher, until we believe in every aspect of life, whatever we experience, in our words, whatever we experience, they are all miracles, there is no nature or, or customary uh, just the, the way of the world, natural occurrences. No, there is no such thing, explains the Ramban. doesn't exist. The idea, explains the Ramban, is that whatever you experience in your day-to-day life, everything which we do not perceive to be a miracle is indeed a miracle. It may be what we would call a hidden miracle, but it is nevertheless a miracle because there is no such thing as nature. There's only HaKadosh Baruch Hu that's running everything. That's why, famously, if you take the word for nature, which is HaTeva, HaTeva means nature, okay? What's the gematria of HaTeva? 86, which is the same gematria as Elohim, 86. Because nature doesn't exist. What exists? Elohim, Hashem. Hashem that is in charge of everything, causing everything, the force behind everything that makes it move, makes it go, makes it makes the world turn around, basically. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the force behind it all. That's our job. Our job is to understand that, yes, back in Mitzrayim, back in Egypt, there were miracles, revealed miracles. And we have to remember that every day. We have to kiss the mezuzah when we walk by and remember that Hashem is in charge of everything. We have to put on tefillin in our, in our morning to remember HaKadosh Baruch Hu took us out of Mitzrayim. We have to celebrate on Pesach and on Sukkot to remember Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. Yes. We have to say Kiddush Friday night to remember that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. Yes. But now is next step. Now we have to go up to the next level, says the Ramban, which is to remember that not only what we see as open miracles are miracles, but even our day-to-day activities that we hold to be natural, uh, earthly occurrences, these things are all miracles as well. Because there is no standard way of the world, but rather it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu who's causing it to continue to go and to, and to keep it in the very existence at all times. That's our, that's our lesson over here. Now, why is this last step so important? Why is this last step that the Ramban is telling us to understand that everything in our lives, every step that we take, everything around us is all miraculous? Why is that so important? The idea is 
that when a person finally understands that and he puts full faith in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the idea that Hashem is with me every step of the way, every minute of the day. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is with me and never leaves me. Hashem is always together with me. And you put your bitachon, you put your faith in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and you say, Hashem, I know that you never let me go. You're always with me. When you start to think like that, that's when, if a person needs a Yeshua, he needs a salvation, he needs something to happen, something to change, he's got an issue in his life, he has to you know, address it somehow. The increase in the faith and the knowledge and the belief that Hashem is with you is what's going to bring you the Yeshua. And I'm, I would like to show you that in this week's parasha itself. Amazing Rabbeinu Bachye. Rabbeinu Bachye in this week's parasha comes up with an unbelievable explanation of a seemingly difficult to understand mitzvah. The Torah Kedoshah tells us that Hashem commanded the Jews that when you, b- before you leave Egypt, I want you to eat a korban Pesach. You're going to take a lamb. You're going to slaughter that lamb. You're going to take the blood of that lamb and you are going to place the blood of that lamb on the doorposts around your door. And when you do that, so at that moment, at midnight, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to send, is going, rather, Hashem is going to, uh, to come and smite the firstborn sons of all the Egyptians. And Hashem will see the blood on your doorpost and, of course, famously, will pass over your doors and will not come into your homes. And that way you'll be saved from this terrible plague. Now, the question is obvious. What is the purpose of this blood on the doorpost? What is it? the blood is going to save the person from having his Hashem uh, get to his family? What's the, what's the reason behind this blood? It's a very odd thing to do. Kadosh Baruch Hu didn't need this any kind of sign for, uh, for the water, right? When, the, when Hashem uh, gave a plague of uh, blood to the, to the Egyptians, Literally, you had a guy with a cup of water, the Egyptian grabs it away, and it's blood. So there's no need for any signs over there. What, what's the idea of this blood over here, that you have to put it on your doorpost, and that's how Hashem will know to you know, pass over your house? It's odd. It's a very odd thing. So I'm going to read to you the words of the Rabbeinu Bachya, and it's exactly the concept that we've been talking about. Rabbeinu Bachya says the following. I'll read to you his words inside. He says, the Pasuk says, Ve'ra'iti et adamu pasachti. I'll see the blood, I'll pass over your home. Says Rabbeinu Bachya, listen very carefully. En hadam monea hanegif. The blood on the doorposts is not what is going to prevent the damage from happening to this family. Velo meni'ato mevi hanegif. Not putting the blood is not what's going to bring the plague into this person's home. Aval, but what's going on over here, says Rabbeinu Bachya? The Torah is teaching you. The person that had full faith in Hashem. And he depended, he, he allowed, to, allowed himself to hang his, his, his uh, faith upon, the, uh, upon Hashem. He had full trust in Hashem. He was not concerned about Paro and his decree, because again, right now he's about to take the sheep, which or the lamb, which is the god of the Egyptians, and he's about to slaughter it publicly. He publicly slaughters the god of the Egyptians. Again, in their face. And he takes the blood of that lamb and he puts it on his doorpost or on the, on the lintel. This man is a tzaddik. He had faith in Hashem. It is befitting for this person. That Hashem should protect him from the from the damaging angel that's going to come, or from the or from Hakadosh Baruch Hu 
that comes to, to, uh, to take the lives of the firstborn. In other words, says Rabbi Nubache, it's got nothing to do with the blood. The blood is not the point. The point over here is very simple. You have to have a strong faith in Hashem to be willing to outwardly violate the law of the land and slaughter the God of the Egyptians. And you know that Paroi is not going to be happy with you. You know that most likely this is a death sentence. And you still say, you know what? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is with me. I'm not scared of these people. I'm not afraid. Hashem is with me. Hashem is in control, not them. So then when you have full faith and you're not scared, so that's a reason for Hashem to redeem you, to save you, to give you what you need in order to survive. That's the point over here. Now, let's take that to another location. Not this week's parasha, next week's parasha. The same exact concept. You see it again and again. And we're going to return to the Korban Pesach shortly. But we find it again before the Jews were about to cross the ocean. Before they were about to cross the Yamsuf. We see over here again the same idea. They're standing at Yamsuf at the Sea of Reeds. Behind them is the Egyptian army that's about to crush them or at the very best, take them back as slaves. In front of them is a sea. There's nowhere to go. And then, a very interesting comment from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Hashem says to Moshe, elai, daber el bnei Yisrael What are you doing? Screaming to me, Hashem says to Moshe. Speak to the Jewish people and let them go. Now, obviously, the question is, what do you mean? First of all, who am I supposed to cry out to, if not you, Hashem? That's number one. But number two, where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to deal with this situation? Comes along the Or Chaim HaKadosh and explains an incredible, incredible thing. This is what Hashem is telling Moshe. There are times where Midat Hadin, the attribute of judgment, gets up and speaks before Hashem. And says, Hashem, these people are not worthy of a miracle. They're not. Like it says over there by the Jews, Halalu of Azar, the Egyptians are idol worshippers. And unfortunately, many of the Jews in front of us here are also idol worshippers. So that's the attribute of judgment speaking before Hashem. And therefore, Hashem says over here, what am I supposed to say? I can't, I don't have a response to them. But over here, Hashem says, this is my suggestion to you. You right now need more mercy. You need the attribute of mercy to overpower the attribute of judgment. How do you do that? He says, Agam, Agam shani asot nes. Hashem says, even though I want to make a miracle, kevan enam midat adin monat. the attribute of judgment is not letting me. They're not worthy. There's not, not enough strength in the attribute of mercy to knock out the attribute of judgment. A miracle cannot happen for you, but this is what you should do. Says the Or HaChaim HaKadosh. This is my suggestion to you, Hashem says, to increase the amount of mercy and kindness in the heavens towards you. This is what you should do. Speak to the Jewish people. Let them strengthen themselves with tremendous faith, with all their hearts. Let them go into the water before the sea splits. Trusting in me that Something will happen, that I will do a miracle for them. Let them have that faith in me. Let them trust in me. When they exhibit that trust, in the merit of that faith that they show, we believe in you, then then mercy will overpower the judgment. And then the sea will split. Because it is incredibly great when a person has this trust and faith in Hashem that will tip the scale in the favor of mercy. 
That's the idea over here, Abutai. This idea that the Ramban was talking about, that we have to remember Egypt, and we have to remember that Hashem took us out of Egypt, and Hashem is watching over everything, and in charge of everything, and in control of everything. And that's why we have so many reminders for everything. When we, when, we, when we have that faith, and we put our lives at risk, and we say, we don't care if Hashem told us to slaughter this sheep, even if it means that, that Paro will hate us and want to kill us, we don't care because we have total trust and faith in Hashem. And says Rabbi Nubakhe, that is the trust and the faith in Hashem that will save you, that will make miracles for you. So the same thing over here. That trust and that faith in HaKadosh Baruch Hu is what split the sea. Hashem says right now they don't deserve a miracle. But when you increase your faith and you make an extra effort and you say no, I believe Hashem could do it. I believe Hashem, you, you're going to make a miracle for me. And Hashem says, that faith that you have, that's going to tip the scale. That's going to push more chesed, more kindness, more, more mercy in your direction. That's what we're learning over here. And with this, you see something, I think, very clearly regarding what we had by the Korban Pesach. There's a famous question that everybody asks. It's a question that bothered me for a long time too. I was so happy when I finally saw an answer. We say in the Haggadah of Lel Pesach, we say that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Ani velo shaliach. I'm going to be the one to come and smite the firstborn in Egypt. And it's going to be me. And it's not going to be a shliach. It's not going to be anybody else who's doing it. It's going to be me, Hashem says. Not an angel. Nobody except for me. Famous question is, wait a second, what does it say when you put the blood on the doorposts? So it says that, that, that Hashem will not allow the destroyer, which is a name for an angel, right, to come into your home. But I thought, Hashem, you just, you just said a second ago that it's going to be you and not an angel. So which one is it? Is it Hashem or is it an angel? The, called the mashchit. Right? Well, what's going on? So over here, comes along the Vilna Gaon with a beautiful, beautiful explanation. And he answers that, no, when it comes to the firstborn, Hashem says, that's going to be me. I will kill the firstborn. <coughs> and that's not going to change. Now, it happens to be that there are other reasons that a person might die. The person might, uh, he might have, it just might be his time. You know, the guy's 107 years old and uh, he lived a full life. It's time to go. Uh, a person may have, uh, God forbid, other reasons to go. He, uh, God forbid, a heart attack or whatever, what, what may be. <coughs> that is the job of the angel called Mashchit. That's his job. Says the Vilna Gaon. <coughs> the message over here is that when the people would put the blood on their doorposts. Again, exhibiting a tremendous amount of faith, doing something not easy, willing to risk their lives, going above nature in order to do something that they do because they believe in Hashem. So then Hashem says, you know what? If you're going above your own nature, then I'll go above your nature too. If the person normally was supposed to die tonight because he's 120 years old, then I will not allow him to die tonight. I won't even allow the regular mashchit, the, re the, the regular malach to come into the person's home. Because you are going above your nature for me, so I will go above nature for you. That's the way it works. Person does above and beyond. He, he goes beyond what is natural, then Hashem says, so I'll do the same thing for you. You have a tremendous emunah in me, then I'll bring that back your direction. That's a huge, huge lesson that we can learn. I heard, I heard a beautiful story from Rabbi Elimelech Biderman. He says over a ma'aseh that took place, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago uh, in Bnei Brak. There was somebody that, uh, there was a wedding hall in Bnei Brak that uh, the manager of the hall double booked the hall. Now the hall had two main simcha halls. One was a very big, uh, big simcha hall, and the other one was a smaller one. Now this manager double booked the big simcha hall for both 
uh, it was both for a Sheva Brachot for two different families. And the, uh, you know, the, the families show up the night of the Sheva Brachot and they're shocked. They say, hey, what's going on over here? We have a Sheva Brachot tonight. And the other one says, well, yeah, we do too. And they realize that there's a whole big uh, mix up over here. And nobody wants to go to the small Simcha Hall. They both have a lot of guests. And they're in a, they're in a big uh, situation, a big dilemma. So one of them, one of the two families basically overpowered the other family out of the Simcha Hall. And they went to the smaller Simcha Hall. Now they called the owner of the Simcha Hall and said, listen, you know, we, we paid for this. We, we you know, are supposed to be in the big Simcha Hall. Deal with the situation. Get us our place. And the other family is saying no such thing. So the, the owner of the Simcha Hall is, you know, he's, he's absolutely shocked. He runs down and he tries to figure out what to do. So he tells this family in the smaller Simcha Hall, listen, you know, I, I'm so sorry. I'm firing the manager. He messed up royally. He did things terrible. I mean, I can't believe what he did. But listen, I, I'm sorry, but we're in a situation right now. Can we let them stay there and you guys stay here and I, I'll pay for half of the costs of the of the uh, of the food and I'll, uh, I'll I'll set you up for Shabbat in a hotel over here. Nobody will have to go back. They could stay here. And uh, and he goes on. He's trying to you know alleviate the you know to mitigate the situation. And they're like, no way. The other family was so disrespectful to us. Look, they shoved us out over here. We don't want to know from it, and we paid for it. And not only not only that, but if you don't put us back there, we're going to sue you. We're going to cause you uh, you know a lot of damage to your to your name and your reputation and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he realized he has nobody to talk to over there. Now he goes to the other family. He says, maybe he has a chance with them uh, to maybe try and get them to agree to go to the smaller simple. So he goes to the uh, Bala Simcha over there. And he says to him, listen, you know, we had a big mistake. I'm very sorry. But the other family is giving me a very hard time. And they're adamant they want to have this Simcha hall. He says, them? Do you know how disgusting they were? You know what they said to me? They said this, they said that. I don't want to know from them. I don't want to hear from them. And let me tell you something, if you move us there, then we're going to be very upset. And he had a whole big, you know, to do with this guy as well. So he realizes that he's, you know, you know, he's, he's stuck. So he goes to the person, he says, listen, can I ask you for a personal favor? He says, I understand we messed up. The manager is gone. I fired him. He's never coming back to work here. Just can I ask you for me, for me personally, you know, I didn't mess up. I didn't do anything wrong. I just, I, I'm just stuck over here. Can you please, for me personally, do me a favor and just take your event to the smaller sim call, please? And the guy had a little bit of mercy. And he said, listen, as far as I'm concerned, I don't mind. I understand. For you, I'll do you a favor. But my wife, she'll never want to hear from this. No way. After her conversation with the other lady from the other party, oh, no, 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 it's not, it's not going to happen. I mean, he says, do you mind if I talk to her? So he said, listen, you can talk to her. Try. I wish you good luck. I would do it for you, but I don't think you're going to get anywhere with her. He goes to the wife. He starts talking to the wife. And he says to her, listen, you know, we double booked. It was a mistake. I don't want to hear from it. We were in the party already. I had to deal with those other people. Listen, if you don't want any trouble, just walk away. He says, listen to me, please. I'm begging you. Do me a favor. He says, I don't want to know from it. You know what? I had to deal with those people over there. It's not happening. Walk away. He says to her, listen, don't you have anything in your life that you need a Yeshua? You need some kind of miracle, something to happen that's going to save your situation. Don't you have anything where you really need Hashem's help in anything, something? She says, now that you mention it, I do. She says that her father, unfortunately, was diagnosed with the bad disease, Lohaleinu. And they had to go through many CAT scans, and they found that he has the, the bad disease. And unfortunately, they're going to go through a surgery, which he, it's not so simple for him to go through the surgery. And she says, yes, I do need a Yeshua. I need a Yeshua for my father. That's what she said. So he said, listen, in the zchut of you giving up for your father, I want to bless you that your father should have a refuah But please, help me out with this. So she said, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to give up this Sheva Brachot for my family. I'm going to give it to that family. And we're going to go to the smaller Simcha Hall. And I'm doing it for the zchut of my father. 
that he should have a refuah shlema. And just so that the zuchut should be a complete zuchut, I want it to be that you hire again that manager that you fired. So that should be a totally complete zuchut. So he said, you got it. Agreed. So they make the swap. And the father was in Belgium at the time. He was seeing doctors in Brussels. And he didn't, uh, he wasn't doing well. And uh, they made the swap. Now he goes home. He says, oh, Shabbat Shemalad, thank God. I don't have to worry about this headache anymore. Everything is good. And he forgot about the whole thing. Meanwhile, he gets a call a few days later on a Wednesday or a Thursday night. And it's a call from Belgium. And he hears that this father, Baruch Hashem, is doing very well. They were about to do the surgery on the father. And it turns out that, the, that it was not malignant. It was benign. They said, what's going on? We're about to operate on him. They see what the CAT scan says, that there's nothing, that it's not malignant. Baruch Hashem, everything is good. So they saw the Yeshua. But what happened over here, said of Elimelech Biderman, beautiful, in the name of Rabbi Phil Michalov Zlotche, the idea was that when you rise above nature, when you do for Hashem, you know that this is going to do nachat for Hashem, and you rise above your nature, then Hashem says, I will rise above nature too. But it all starts with the understanding that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in charge of everything. That is the lesson of Yetziat Mitzrayim. That's, that's what the Ramban is teaching us. That's what the Benu Bache was teaching us. That's what the Orach Haim HaKadosh was teaching us. That when a person has full faith in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and strengthens his faith and pushes his faith forward, that's what brings about the miracles. When, when he rises above nature, when he rises above his own nature, then Hashem says, I'll rise above nature for you too, and I'll perform miracles for you as well. So this Rabotai is a very important lesson for ourselves, that we have to understand that, first of all, Hashem is always in charge, being mashgiach over everything. But more importantly, to understand that this is our opportunity to bring about the Yeshuot by increasing our faith, by increasing everything, our understanding of in bitachon and Hashem, that's what brings about the Yeshua. That's what we're learning tonight. And uh, and of course, the, tonight's show is sponsored, Le'ilui Nishmat Bracha Polet Batachel Alea Shalom, that this was really like her motto in life, to increase a person's faith in Hashem, to, imp- to increase our emunah, to increase our bitachon. And uh, this was, uh, was really something that she stood for. So it's very uh, befitting that this is what we're learning about tonight. This is really the parasha, parashat bo, that really we can delve into this subject because this was a Ramban to remember, that he really, really expressed this concept so super duper clearly that this is the fundamental belief that we have in all of the Torah, that this is why we were created, to understand that Kadosh Baruch Hu is with us, watching us, created us, and to thank him for that and to acknowledge that, and that gives nachat to Hashem. And when we increase our faith in that, we push ourselves further, and Hashem does Yeshuot for us. Zal Hashem, we'd like to wish you all a wonderful evening. Zal Hashem, Blineder, we will continue next week, Tuesday night, uh, studying um, the next week's parasha. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.